Welcome to a special NFL Draft edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. I'm back once again. This is Derek Rackley joined by my guys, just audio only this time, Dave Archer and DJ Shockley. We go through all things Atlanta Falcons, and boy, do we have some stuff to talk with you about today. Yes, that's right. The 2021 NFL Draft, the first round has just wrapped up, and with the fourth overall selection in the 2021 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons select tight end Kyle Pitts out of Florida. So let's get some instant reaction to this selection. I'm going to start with my man, Dave Archer, because he went ahead and had his own draft board set up for this year. And I heard him right before we got started talking about where he felt like Kyle Pitts fell on his draft board. Dave, what is your reaction to the pick? Yeah, I'm ecstatic, uh, Rack, and good to be with you in shock here. This is a, I, first of all, the feeling that I had going into the draft was only anything I've I felt in quite some time. I mean, the hair was standing up on the back of my neck, the excitement of what potentially could happen, where are we going to go, what was going to be standing there at four when we had a chance to pick. Well, when it came down to it, Kyle Pitts still sitting there at the number four spot. You kind of had a feeling he would be there, was quarterback in the mix. I certainly think that there was some conversation about Justin Fields and maybe some of the quarterback issues or talk there. But Kyle Pitts was rated number two on my board of, of the best players available, behind, right behind Trevor Lawrence. So you got the best positional player in the draft, and you just got better in the red zone, guys. We were 27th in the league in the red zone last season. You just guaranteed yourself stepping into that top 15, top 10 in the National Football League in the red zone because of the acquisition of Kyle Pitts. And DJ, you've got a chance to call some games in the E, and I'm sure you probably had a chance to see Kyle Pitts in action with your own two eyes. Sometimes with, as an analyst, guys, you can watch a guy on tape, and it's just a little different when you can see him on the field with your own eyes. DJ, I want to get your impressions on, number one, what you think of Kyle Pitts of a player, what you saw when you watched him on tape, when you watched him in person, and how you feel he fits into this Atlanta offense. Rick, I think the first thing that comes to mind – and you think about a guy of his stature, of his ability, you say this guy has the ability to win anywhere on the field. And Arch just talked about his ability to win in the red zone. And that's a plus, that's a plus, that's a bonus. But this guy also has a chance to win at every spot on the field. You can line up in the slot, you can line him up on outside. And you watch this guy run the same route tree as receivers run every single day and this guy can make those plays and the guy just matches up, you know, just he's a matchup problem versus anybody. And I went back and I saw something where uh, the last time a tight end was drafted this high, you got to go all the way back to 1961 with Mike Ditka and he went fifth overall. And here's Kyle Pitts going fourth. This is a unbelievable pick for the Falcons. And uh, I think Archer spot on, this is a game changer, a guy who, who's going to come in here from day one and demand the football. And he is going to have many opportunities in this offense where Arthur Smith loves the tight end. And he's going to be a guy who catches tons of footballs from Matt Ryan. Uh, 2021, obviously a big year following the pandemic season in the NFL, but it's also going to be a year that's known not only for Kyle Pitts setting NFL history, going down in NFL history as the highest drafted tight end, but also the fact that you got a first-year head coach in Arthur Smith and a first-year general manager in Terry Fontenot that are not afraid to go out there and make that history by drafting a tight end. And Dave, what I think is so interesting here is because when you get into a, the draft, everybody has opinions. And it seems like with every selection, every player, there's some type of criticism. Well, this guy's got great upside, but dot, 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 right? There's always something that this guy sure. can do better. And maybe we didn't hear that with Trevor Lawrence a whole lot, but one thing I don't think I've seen all night is one person criticize Kyle Pitts as a player or him being drafted number four. I think that should show everybody in Atlanta what they need to know about this player. Well, it's a generational player. Uh, this guy has a chance, and again, he's got to go prove it on the field, but would you like what you've seen in college? Shock just talked about his ability in the college ranks as he steps into the National Football League, his inability uh, or his ability to create matchup problems all over the field for you. But this could be a, one of those generational players. you got to forget about thinking about him as a tight end. This is not right. just a tight end. This is a <laughs> six foot six, 240-pound wide receiver that runs 4'4". 
Go look at him in individual matchups and routes that he runs. He screws corners in the ground. He runs by corners and catches and high points the ball over the top, some of the best corners in college football. I mean, the two, there's two guys at Georgia are going to go in the top two rounds of the draft. We saw one go in the draft tonight, and Eric Stokes. Tyson Campbell's going to go in the draft, too. He beat both those guys one-on-one. -on -one. Those guys are top top picks in the draft at the corner spot. This is a this is a guy that is going to transcend the tight end position. I think we got to forget about tight end. This is a big-time player, uh, an elite-level player that uh, is going to transcend the position he plays. You know, I got a chance to watch guys the or listen and watch his opening press conference with the Atlanta media, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of words that came out. And number one was one of his answers to our own Kelsey Conway, asking him a question about when his name was called and when he got the phone call from the Atlanta Falcons. He said it was surreal. Even a kid that's so grounded and knows that he's so talented, it was surreal to him to hear his name called. Uh, and the other thing that I thought was interesting is – he, they were, everybody was asking him what makes him so good. Why is he such a great player? Why is he such a matchup nightmare? And he was talking about being versatile. He kept saying being versatile. And I feel like at the tight end position in the NFL, DJ, we're always talking about, oh, this guy's a matchup nightmare because a corner's too small to cover him and a linebacker or safety is not fast enough to cover him. And I feel like if there's one tight end now, granted, we have to see it on an NFL field this next season, that you would put in that category – as a guy that's versatile and he's a matchup nightmare or what people are calling the unicorn, it's Kyle Pitts because you just don't have a way to slow him down with everything that he brings to the table. Yeah, and you look at the new age of the tight ends these days, the Kittles of the world, uh, the guys who are asking for the football like receivers, he is in that mold. And when you think about some of the things that he can do on the field and you think about some of the things that he has already done, as quarterbacks, I know for me and Dave, it makes you smile because you know this guy's going to be able to win. You know this guy understands coverages. He understands how to use his body. He understands how to use that big 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six frame when he goes against a linebacker, going against a safety, going against a corner, or knows how to set up certain routes. Those are certain things that you just don't see. And I think we're going away from the days of, yeah, you're still going to have those tight ends with their hand in the dirt, and you ask them to go and you know block these defensive ends, but also – we're going more to the stage of we want a guy that can stand up in the slot. We want a guy who can be uh, – it looks like 11 personnel, but this guy, you might as well call it 10 because you got four receivers out there with him. It's going to be fun to have this guy line up all over the place and you not know where the football can go because in this Arthur Smith style of offense, he's going to give you an indication if it's man or zone and Kyle Pitts is going to be that guy. But at the end of the day, we're looking for the matchup, and he's going to be the matchup problem – that a lot of teams are looking for from that tight end position. And that's what makes this league so special now is these guys coming into the league. For a long time, it's always been about the defensive ends, how fast they are. Can they get to the pass rusher? Now it's about you got receivers and tight ends who looked exactly the same. And now the Falcons have one in Cal Pitts. It's going to be so fun to watch. Yeah, DJ, you're talking about the style of offense from Arthur Smith, and, and he's a very tight end heavy, loves the tight ends, and there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about Kyle Pitts joining this offense with the complement of other skill position players, the Calvin Ridley's, the Julio Joneses of the world. But I think you also have to throw into that category now Hayden Hurst because maybe the one criticism you could have on Kyle Pitts is what type of an inline blocker is he right now? And my answer would be, he doesn't really have to be. Okay, you've got a guy like Hayden Hurst that can be that guy on the end of the line of scrimmage that can help out in the run game, provide some chips and pass protection. And yes, is it an area that Kyle Pitts can improve on? But think about the combinations now of a guy like Hayden Hurst who can catch the ball uh, at, the, at the tight end position. He showed throughout his career, former first round pick, having both of those guys on the field arch. Think about that type of a setup with those two wide receivers on the outside that Matt Ryan's going to have 21. Well, it certainly puts you in a situation, a rack and shock, where you are in a run set with two tight ends on the field. But then, as Shock has said, and Hurst adds to this mix, they Hurst runs as well as a lot of receivers do as well. So you've got two guys that can get vertical in that tight end position, uh, as well as, as Ridley and Jones on the outside or Gage in the game, whoever might be in the game at the receiver spot. All of a sudden, you like the fact that I can shift immediately, shift gears, and be a pass threat 
even though I've got two tight ends on the field and I want to run it with Mike Davis or Cordell Patterson or, or uh, whoever we've got in the backfield at the time. I thought that it was really cool to hear Pitts say when he was interviewed right after being taken by the Falcons, he talked about surreal and you mentioned that. I thought it, it was very humbling for him. He said, well, I just hope to be a good outlet for Matt Ryan, an outlet. Ah. I thought, <laughs> I thought the, that humble comment <laughs> kind of really said miles of, of information about what kind of team oriented guy is. He just wanted to be able to come in and contribute. He's going to do more than that. Now I will say rack, neither one of these guys are great blockers. And I think that's going to be an area they're going to have to improve on. Pitts has improved dramatically. His first two years at Florida was not a very good blocker at all. You go back and put the tape on this year. He's improved dramatically on the edge as an inline blocker. So, um, it's not his best thing, nor is it the best thing that Hayden Hurst does. But I think both of them are going to be efficient enough in it to where the run game is going to be a threat with them both on the field as pass receivers. Yeah, I think it's uh, definitely some smiles going on in the Falcons building. One being Arthur Smith kind of going to be putting his fingers together, figuring out what he's going to devise to have this new weapon on offense. And also Matt Ryan, maybe a sigh of relief for him, knowing that he's got another really, really talented skill position player and weapon out there offensively for them to move the football down the field. And as you mentioned, Arch, to start this thing out, a big time target for him in the red zone. One of the things that that Kyle Pitts talked about in his press conference and I, that kind of along that humbling thing, Dave, that you were talking about was learning from Julio Jones and picking his brain as far as how he attacks defenses, gets open and becomes such a threat downfield. However, guys, I think we have to change gears a little bit and kind of address what we've been hearing going on. There's been a lot of rumors out there in the national media about Julio Jones and potentially being traded at some point throughout the draft or maybe this weekend. So we talked a lot about having those weapons, Kyle Pitts, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, all being on the field together. But DJ, I want to start with you. What are you thinking are the chances or what would be your thoughts and opinions if the Bills decide to work out some type of trade and Julio Jones is not on the outside in 2021? Well, I think obviously we see what happened here at number four and bringing in a guy like Kyle Pitts. Now, if it does not work for Julio Jones and he's no longer an Atlanta Falcon, nobody can replace the, the kind of production that Julio Jones brings. It's hard to have a guy on the field like him who demands that kind of double coverage and makes everybody else kind of single up and have that kind of uh, effect on the field. Um, and it, it helps having a guy like Kyle Pitts coming here who can kind of take some of that pressure off of the offense and bring that production in. Now, that production is going to be – uh, kind of spread out between all the guys. But I think we also saw last year in the last, you know, seven or eight games when you didn't have uh, Julio Jones, Calvin really stepped up to the plate for over 40-some catches, 717 yards, three touchdowns. I mean, he was a, a, a one-man wrecking crew in his own right. Uh, not having Julio Jones would be something that I know a lot of Atlanta fans would uh, probably be a little sour about. But you have to be honest, this is a business. And at the end of the day, uh, when things don't work out and – Things don't work out salary cap wise, as we know. Uh, we can let Arch explain that he's our our resident salary guy. Uh, but uh, obviously, things uh, in that part of the world absolutely have to be worked out. And if uh, a guy, not because of what he's done on the field, but because of that salary, doesn't work out for you, then obviously you got to find a way to move on, and then you try to replace those guys. So this is a, a interesting situation that still has to play out, and everybody's still uh, waiting to see what happens. But uh, one way or another, I know. Uh, Arthur uh, Smith and Terry Fonda is going to do what's best for the Atlanta Falcons organization. You know, we've we talked a little bit about a generational type player and Kyle Pitts. And I think if you rewind back when Julio Jones came out, the same could have been said about him, Dave. So I'm going to turn the question over to you, a potential um, generational player and Julio Jones that the Falcons have had on their roster for a number of years. Many would say he still would fall into the top five in the NFL when he is healthy. But when you factor in the things that you've seen over the last couple of years, do you feel like there's some legs to these trade rumors about Julio Jones no longer being a member of the Falcons? Yeah, I think there is, Rack. And I think that uh, when you begin to look at what Terry Fontenot's talked about, where nobody is above uh, reproach, this is going to be one of those scenarios where they're going to evaluate every opportunity. The Falcons are over the cap right now. They're, to be able to sign their rookie draft class, from what I understand, they need about $11 million. They, they don't have it. Uh, a post-June 1 
uh, trade of Julio Jones would free up $15 million. I mean, that, that's a real fact. That's something that's going to have to be considered. Uh, the thing about this thing, and Shock mentioned it, business is business. It's one thing to get sentimental about players. And Julio Jones will have some – I've called every game of his career. Uh, you talk about – nobody's going to be more sentimental about him than I will be. He's made some unbelievable plays here. But uh, it is a business. And when you look at it, uh, have you drafted a guy that can replace Julio? This guy can play on the outside. I feel better right now as a Falcon fan, not as a broadcaster or someone that works for the Falcons. I feel better as a Falcon fan. We've drafted a guy that could potentially play in that spot. Yes, he looks like a tight end, but he plays like a wide receiver. I feel better about that situation. But I don't think there's any question that Terry Fontenot is going to have to consider all the options. And one of those options will be potentially moving on from Julio Jones or sending Julio Jones someplace else simply because the money and the way that works out. Yeah, and I think um, that's the area where a lot of fans, as you mentioned, DJ, that there's going to be some people, if this ends up um, coming to fruition, that are going to be very upset. They're going to be against it. They're going to say, why do you do something like this? And it's because mainly of what Dave is talking about. Every NFL player wants to get his huge payday in the NFL. And Julio Jones got his huge payday in the NFL from the Atlanta Falcons. But at some point, it's going to end up strapping the organization as far as getting better and making it more team friendly. That's part of the reason why the Patriots did so well for so many years. Tom Brady took a whole lot less money per year than he probably could have what he is worth but he was able to spread that out and allow them to bring in more quality players. And they had so much success doing it. And maybe that's going to have to be the new mold for Atlanta as it sits right now with the salary cap situation for them to add more players to make this team better. They may have to move on from one number 11. That's done so many great things for this organization. Obviously time will tell, but we'll see whether or not Julio Jones is going to be in the mix and be on the field next year, along with Calvin Ridley and Kyle Pitts and the rest of those skill position players. All right, guys, in closing, we just got finished with the first round. We added one really good player to the 2021 roster for the Atlanta Falcons. I want you guys to look ahead, DJ. What do you expect to see in the next couple of rounds going on? We're going to get back with rounds two and three starting tomorrow or tonight, depending on when you listen to this one. DJ, what are you looking forward to seeing from the Falcons? Well, obviously, there are a couple of needs that uh, I think the Falcons must address. Uh, one, obviously, in a system where Arthur Smith wants you to be able to run the football, finding another running back, I think, is another uh, key spot to be looking for in the second and third round. And also, uh, I think you got to go in and find your corner. Uh, obviously, a couple really good corners, well, actually, three corners went in this first round, and uh, J.C. Horn, Patrick Sertain, Caleb Furley are all guys who are quality players who absolutely will look good in a Falcon uniform, but these are still needs that I think the Falcons have to go out and dress. And uh, I think a guy like a Richie Grant from UCF or a Asante Samuel Jr. out of Florida State, I mean, guys who fit the mold of what uh, they want to do on the defensive side of the ball with DMPs and be versatile and have guys who can play multiple spots is something to absolutely look for in the second and third round. So I expect the Falcons probably to be more uh, defense heavy here in the, in the second and third mm-hmm. round here on Friday and see what happens. Dave, I was, I was, there was, there was a part of me that was thinking, would Atlanta try to get back into this first round at the tail end of it and see if they could take a run at Najee Harris or Travis Etienne? Those guys ended up going back to back. Najee Harris to Pittsburgh at 24, Jacksonville gets Travis Etienne at number 25 to pair up with his quarterback, (laughs) Trevor Lawrence. Probably a little bit too much for Atlanta, but I was thinking the court, the, the running back need in the backfield for Atlanta, those two guys would have fit the bill. But what are you looking for to see on Friday in the next couple of rounds or maybe even throughout the rest of the weekend for the Atlanta Falcons to help uh, continue to bolster their roster? Well, guys, the guy I like at running back is Devontae Williams, the kid out of North Carolina. He is a battering ram, tackle-blaking monster. Uh, so I think he's still, still out there and available. I'm looking at edge rushers, guys. I'm looking at guys are going to fit what Dean Pease wants to do from a versatility standpoint, morphing from 3-4 to 4-3, the ability to have an edge guy that can, that has the versatility to stand up, put his hand in the dirt, looking for guys like Joseph Osai, Azee Ozolari from, from Georgia still out there. Uh, You also have Ronnie Perkins from you, uh, from uh, uh, Oklahoma. There's some very versatile edge guys that are still available, difference making guys that can get after passer. Uh, Shock talking about that corner, no question. 
I'm talking about edge rusher as well. I think that those guys that Jock mentioned and some of those, those three guys I just mentioned are certainly going to be in the mix in the first part of the second round. Yeah, you guys nailed it on the head. I would have said the same thing. I've been looking running back and defensive help, pass rushing and corner would be the areas that I think needs to get addressed for Atlanta to kind of help shore up that roster a little bit. Still a long ways to go in this draft, still a long ways to go in building this roster, and of course a long ways until we start 2021 season. But as we talked about, the Atlanta Falcons made a huge splash in selecting Kyle Pitts, number four overall pick, the talented tight end out of Florida to help out this offense and Matt Ryan and Arthur Smith next season. So that's going to wrap it up here on this special first round NFL draft edition of the Falcons audible presented by AT&T. Once again, I'm Derek Rackley with my guys, Dave Archer and DJ Shockley. And maybe just maybe they'll let us come back and talk a little bit more about this draft, but hopefully the Atlanta Falcons and that front brass continue to build on this roster and make it an even better product on the field in 2021. Thanks so much for listening, folks. We hope you enjoy the rest of the draft this weekend, and we'll be here to talk to you about all things Atlanta Falcons.